Okay, let's open uh, to the scriptures this morning to uh, Ephesians chapter 5. As we have been going verse by verse through the book of Ephesians, so important. Uh, it's so important that we, you know, sometimes rather than talk about topographical uh, subjects, you know, like preach on the love of God or things like that, that sometimes we just do a book study and, and go through a book. And so that's what we're doing. Um, actually, for the last number of weeks, eight or so weeks, uh, we've been going through the book of Ephesians verse by verse and tearing into it and looking at it. And, um, and this is how the Lord builds his church, is through the scriptures. We're here today because of Jesus. I love singing that song, Your Great Name, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. The reason we're here today is because we love Jesus. We're followers of Christ. And, um, and sometimes we get tested in that. There was one church service that they were right in the middle of church just as we are now. And all of a sudden there was a great big ball of fire and a thunderclap. And Satan appeared right in the middle of that church. And everybody ran out every possible door in all different directions except one old crotchety old man just sitting there. And the devil walked up to him and he goes, I am Beelzebub, the prince of darkness. Lucifer, how is it that you don't fear me? And he said, why should I? I've been married to your sister for 38 years. <laughs> Anyways, so, <laughs> so as we look at chapter 5 this morning, um, just to recap a little bit because we had a week off, in chapter 4 we really started seeing where the theme started shifting from a lot of theology and a lot of truths that God speaks about us, who we are as followers of Christ and believers in Jesus, and now he started shifting a little bit to practical application and he started talking about walking uh, with God, walking worthy before the Lord. And in verse 4, there was a lot of this put away these things, put off the old man. And now he shifts as we're getting into chapter 5 a little bit, and he's going to say putting off by following. And so he's going to talk about um, following the Lord this morning. And here in Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2, Paul writes these words. He says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. You know, one thing about children is a lot of times kids love to mimic their parents, right? You know, they, they like to be like their parents. Their parents are their role models, and rightfully so. Parents should be the role models of their kids. And so this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, listen, as the children of God, be imitators of God. And as he's talking about this, Paul is drawing from something by the use of Greek words that we don't see right off the bat. We don't get it right off the bat, and that is, is the training of an orator. Of a, of an orator. Uh, in, in this culture, in Greek culture, orators were very uh, popular. Uh, they would go around and speak philosophies and theories and worldviews, and they were very prestigious. It was almost like a performance. It was almost like a show. And so if somebody wanted to go into that field of being an uh, orator, uh, there was three things that they had to know. They had to know theory. They had to know the theory of, of oration and, and public speaking. They had to know the practice of it. In other words, their train of thoughts, their disciplines of, uh, of logic and the use of words. And they had to imitate the greats like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and all these. And so imitation was a big factor in becoming an, or an orator. And so what Paul is saying is like, listen, if you want to be a great orator, if you want to be a great public speaker, you have to imitate the greats. But if you want to be a believer, you have to imitate God. You have to be a follower of God. And the word he uses there uh, for imitates is the word uh, mimitus. And mim mimitus is where we get the word mimic. I think, I think some scriptures may even say, uh, be, you know, mimic God, uh, some renders of the scriptures. And so he's saying to mimic God. And, you know, sometimes when, when you're a little kid, you, well, I used to do this to my sisters anyway, you know, they'd say something and I'd say it back, you know, and they'd say, quit talking to me. And I go, quit talking to me, you know, and just I'd mimic everything that they're saying to drive them crazy, and, um, which was a short trip. But they would, um, the, this is what he's saying, to be followers of God, we want to we wanna mimic God, we want to imitate God, we want to, literally another word for this is parrot, we want to parrot God, 
and, and we want to think the way he thinks, talk the way he talks, and, and, and be like him. And he says that the way we do that is to walk in love. He says the, the number one thing that, that Jesus did is that he goes on, he says that Christ, he, he loved himself and he gave himself up for us. Uh, and then he says as a fragrant aroma you know over 50 times in the old testament it talked about the sacrifices of aroma there was the altar of incense that was like prayers and worship going to the lord there was the altar of sacrifice when they would burn the fat of the offering and it says that that was a fragrance in the nostrils of god and that he was pleased um, with these sacrifices and here he's saying that jesus didn't you know, offer up a burnt offering or didn't offer up incense. He offered up his life. He laid his life down, and that was an aroma to the nose of God. And he says, as we mimic the Lord, uh, we want to love one another with that same sacrificial love uh, in which Jesus loved us. And so he starts off this thought by saying, listen, follow Jesus, mimic Jesus, imitate, parrot Jesus. And now he's going to kind of switch thoughts in an area of life that is anything but following Jesus. In verses 3, he goes, But immorality and impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. He's calling you saints. And there must be no filthiness, no silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. If there is one thing that Christianity introduced to the ancient world that had not already been in place, it was chastity and healthy sexuality. God is the one that created us sexual. God is the one that said, Let us make man in our image male and female. And he designed our sexuality as a great blessing and as a great gift. And through the channels of that, we would have the high calling and the ability of procreation, of actually giving birth and and, and having the the family uh, of human beings continue to spread, as he said, uh, populate the earth, replenish the earth, and, uh, and subdue it. And so we have this great blessing Uh, But God says that it is confined to the marriage bed. He said, this is a great opportunity. I remember years ago watching football, and they were interviewing Roger Starbuck. Roger Starbuck used to be a great quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. I wasn't a Cowboy fan, but I really liked Roger Starbuck because he was a born-again Christian, and he had a high level of ethics. And one of the um, people that were interviewing him, you could see that they were trying to kind of put him down because of his Christian values and uh, because all the other players were very promiscuous and they had women and all these you know, groupies and fans that would follow them. And, and they, said, uh, they said, they asked him a question along the lines, and I can't get it verbatim, but they asked him a question along the lines about, um, you know, you don't, uh, you don't seem to have as much sex as your teammates. And he said, quite contrary, I probably have more sex than my teammates, but it's healthy and it's in the confines of my marriage. And I thought, wow, what an incredible testimony. Yes, I have more sex, enjoy sex, but it's with my wife. And it's healthy and it's right and it's pure. And this is what Jesus introduced to the church and introduced to the ancient world because the ancient world was pretty much like our society today. You know, it started in the 60s with the sexual revolution. And now we're at the place where anything goes. The other day I was watching the news. Just yesterday, I just, my, my mom was actually watching the news. I walked by and I just, and it was amazing because all the, you know, the, the, they were saying how uh, Barney Frank is marrying his homosexual boyfriend. And how everybody in Massachusetts is celebrating and they said, you know, they're two good people and they should have the right to be happy. And as soon as that ended, they went right into, our nation is experiencing one of the most severe droughts and 43% of our corn crops are lost. And the price of corn is going to skyrocket. And they're saying no, no end in sight. And I was like, is this kind of ironic? Does anybody else connect the dots here, you know? <laughs> you know, as we flaunt ourselves in the face of God and we find him 
moving away from us and we experience what it's like to not have God. Uh, you know, the Bible says, uh, unless God watches over a nation, or, you know, those who try to do it are doing it in vain. And so we have uncontrollable forest fires and we have uncontrollable heat waves and, and all kinds of crazy things. The economy tanking out and a lack of jobs and all kinds of things going on in our world. I'm like, well, doesn't anybody connect the dots? We are thumbing our nose in the face of God, and God, like the gentleman that he is, is just simply withdrawing. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, I, I, I pride myself on being a pretty civil person. And if you start ragging on me, and you start making fun of me, or you start whatever, I'm not going to punch you in the nose. I might, but, I, you know, you, I'll just back away. It's like, hey, you know what? Do what you want to do. I'm just going to back away. And that's what God does. He doesn't sit there and do this stuff to us. He just backs away. And he takes his blessings with him. And then we find ourselves kind of at the discretion of the enemy. And, and the enemy starts wreaking havoc and we start reaping these things. And so he talks about all of these different things that we are not to indulge in. He talks about immorality. The word there is the Greek word phornea. Fornia is where we get the word fornication, and that's any kind of sexual act outside of marriage. Right now, we live in a society where everybody's doing it, but just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean that everybody's not also going to hell, right? I mean, there are consequences, and I want you to look at what he says at the end of this verse. Anyone who does this does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. And he is talking to the church. He's not talking to the pagan. He's not talking to the idol worshiper. He's not talking to the person that's out there, you know, worshiping a totem pole. He's talking to believers in the church. And he's saying, listen, your sexuality is probably the greatest reflection of what's going on here in the heart. Because it speaks to your allegiance to Christ as well. He talks about impurity, which uh, another word is uncleanliness, which is improper sexual acts. You know, somebody once said to use a feather is kinky, to use the chickens perverted, you know? I mean, and we got people out there just really out there in crazy improper sexual acts. He talks about greed or covetousness, which again, in this context, has a, has a, a, a sexual overtone. It's sexual desires that are uncontrolled. There's a covetousness and a greed in the area. I understand that there's a book out there, I think it's called 54 Shades of Grey or something like that, and it is selling like hotcakes, and it is literally about um, male dominance over women. And there's things in there about, you know, different, uh, just unbelievable practices. And women are the ones that are buying it. And it's talking about male dominance over women in that whole arena of, of, of sexuality. And I'm like, what? We went, from the, we went from the sexual revolution and women's rights to now the pendulum swinging and just crazy things. He goes on and he talks about filthiness. And this is obscenity. I just heard where there's a town that just passed obscenity rules because people are just talking like with gutter mouths. They're just, they're just using the most deplorable language openly and in public. And, you know, they say it's a First Amendment right. And it's like, it's, you know what, no, nobody gives you a right to, to talk like that. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And this is what he's talking about here. He talked about silly talk, which I guess would be like jokes that have racial overtones or sexual overtones or gender overtones. He talks about coarse jesting. And this is, you know what, this is, this is where we get bullying, cyberbullying, and bullying. A big thing in our, in our society today is this bullying thing. And this is what he's talking about, coarse jesting, clowning around, but where you're cutting somebody and you don't understand proper boundaries. And so Paul is really saying, dude, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where we're living life. And then he says, impure people. And, and, and that word impure literally is the word pronos, where we get the word pornography. Some translations put whoremongers. 
uh, somebody that uh, actually it also referred to male prostitutes in this culture where they had both male and female prostitutes in the temples. It's an unclean person who sees everything through the eyes of sex. And then he, lastly, he talks again about a covetous man. Uh, it's a different word here, though, and it means somebody that's craving sexual immorality. So he's talking about, you know, none of these things meet the standards of God. But he says, rather than these things, we should be people who are giving thanks. And especially as we see the day drawing near. And we see the day drawing near. And we should be people of thanks. As a matter of fact, I think as Peter says, as we see the days come, how much more should we live in holy conduct? Because, because we see things unfolding before our eyes. And so he really starts laying some things out for us as believers. He goes on into verse 6. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. And so he's listened. he says, listen, don't listen to preachers or teachers who deceive you with empty words trying to downplay the consequences of all these things that he just mentioned of all this sexual misbehavior because you know there's people well we're under grace and you can do whatever you want to do and you know uh, i heard of one pastor that seduced a woman in his church and he said you know what because we're both righteous it's like two clean sheets hanging on a clothesline and if we meet and enter wine there's still no filthiness or dirtiness in it that's what he's talking about empty words he's talking about downplaying a situation and he says because of this behavior the wrath of God comes. I really get upset when people say, you're homophobic. Well, yeah, because that's what's bringing the wrath of God. Not that I care about, you know, not that I'm, I'm dissing them as individual people. They're broken, they're hurt, they're lost in sin. But the behavior is what is attracting the wrath of God into our country, into our society. And it's not just, and let me just, it's just not the homosexual lifestyle. It's all the fornication that's going on. And everything that's going on with that. And so he's saying, listen, if you are heaven bound, if you're a follower of Christ and you're on your way to heaven, why would you want to live like people who aren't? We're saved. Uh, you know, th this is a great saying. We are saved from God, by God, for God. We're saved from the wrath of God. We're saved by the love of God. And we're saved for the possession of God. And so we need to live right. We don't want to live by, like people who don't know Christ. And he goes on into verse 7 and 8. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And, and, and so he's saying, listen, don't be partakers. The word there is actually participant. Don't be a participant with them. Don't partake in what they're doing. Learn to set yourself aside. Learn to say, you know what? Hey, it's okay. You can call me square. You can call me Jesus freak. You can call me old-fashioned. You can call me our kid. You can call me anything you want. But I'm now a child of light, and I'm not going to go back into the ways of darkness. I want to live. Now, the wonderful thing about sexuality is it's a tremendous blessing and a gift. The Bible says there's nothing defiled in the marriage bed. But it is preserved for the context of marriage. And the Bible says, listen, it's better to marry than to burn. Paul says, if you can be like I am, and if you can stay unmarried so that you consecrate your life to God, that's a great thing. But if you're burning with passion, if you're burning with lust, then get married. And that's where that expression comes from. That's where that experience comes from. And so he's really talking about some things that, that hit us. Um, and he said, he said, you are light. Look at that. Look where he says, he goes, but now you are light. He didn't say you are as light. He said you are light. That's, that's, that's incredible right there. In 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, he says, you are still fleshly, for since there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking as mere men? What a statement. How can we not walk as mere men when we're all part of the human race? Well, because we're no longer part, in a sense, of the human race. We have been born again, and we are unlike any other human being on the planet. We have the nature of God in us, and that's why he's saying, listen, you are now light 
because Christ has come in you, and so why do you want to walk as those who are in dar- darkness? There's something that's happened in you. You should be so thankful, and you should walk as light. He also says in Colossians 1.13, talking about Christ, how he rescued us, or God rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. So we've been rescued from that domain, that's the king's dominion, in this case the dominion of Satan and darkness. He's saying he pulled you out of that dominion of darkness and brought you into the kingdom of his son. And so you are a new citizen you know, we're, we're, not, we're not just of the human race anymore. We are superhuman. Yay. We're superhuman. You know, there's, right now there's such an infatuation with, with superheroes. You know, uh, Marvel and DC and Batman and Spider-Man and all these super people. And there's such an infatuation, as a matter of fact, that the homosexual community thought, hey, we have to have a gay superhero. And so they all of a sudden say, the Green Lantern, he's actually gay. Well, wait a minute. How come they don't have a handicapped superhero? How come they don't have a handicapped superhero? Are are people who are, are, you know, are are people who are handicapped, they don't count? That we have to have a special hooray for the gay community and have a superhero. But you know what? The real superheroes are the people that have the nature of Christ in them. We're superhuman. We have eternal life living in us. And he's saying, listen, this is the way you want to live. You want to live for the Lord. And he goes on, and look at this verse, verses 9 and 10. The fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. He's not talking about the fruit of the Spirit. He's talking about the fruit of light. Because remember, he said, you are light in the Lord. And the fruit of light is goodness. The real word there is really generosity. We're we're sharing. There's a goodness. There's a generosity of spirit. And we're righteous. That means in righteousness, we give God and man their proper due. And we walk in truth. We walk in the truth as it's revealed to us from the word. Look at Psalms 119. The word of is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So as children of the light, we're walking in the light. And the word of God is that light. That's why he's saying trying to know what pleases the Lord. This is where we find what pleases God. This is where we find it. There's so many people that think what pleases God is, is you know all kinds of other things. My works please God. I was reading an article about an atheist that encountered... Um, uh, it was, it was, uh, I think it was Time Magazine or something. They, they had this article on the new atheists. And uh, they say the new atheists bring their kids to church. They may, be sitting, they may be sitting next to you in church. But they'll bring their kids to church. And this one atheist cornered a, a leader in the church, a deacon in the church, and, and they said, uh, just answer me one question. Uh, are you trying to tell me that Mahatma Gandhi is in hell and the guy said I believe he is and he says that's all I need to hear and he never went back again now see obviously hindsight's 2020 but a really good question to revert back to that is are you trying to tell me he's in heaven you're trying to tell me Mahatma Gandhi is in hell and and all you have to look back is saying uh, are do you know that he's in heaven and if so, how did he get there? You're, you're assuming that he got there because of his good works and because of the things he did, and yet that's really what the Scriptures talk about, that it's not our works that present us before God. It's faith. It's faith in Jesus. Jesus is Savior. I can't get there on my own. I can't get there with my intelligence. I can't get there with my finance i can't get there with my good deeds i needed somebody to pick me up and bring me there and that's what jesus does he delivers us from the domain of darkness and presents us to the kingdom of god he brings us into the kingdom of the father and so this is incredible stuff that paul is laying down he goes on in verse 11 do not again do not participate Uh, with them in unfruitful deeds of darkness but instead even expose them for it's disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret and so paul is saying listen now i don't when he's talking about exposing them i don't think he's going around you know saying send uh you know letters to the editor type thing you know uh 
He's talking about going into the workroom and, and lashing out at a coworker because they went to a party um, or, you know, or slept with somebody else in the company or something like that. I think what he's talking about is living in the light in such a way that it exposes the darkness. I don't know if you've ever had anybody accuse you of being a Bible thumper or a Jesus freak or one of those. You know what that tells you? That tells you it's working. It's working. The light is shining in the darkness, and men prefer the darkness and don't like the light. And so, yeah, there's jabs, there's kickbacks, there's pushbacks. But I think this is what he's talking about. Just live in the Lord in such a way that you're exposing the futility of the lifestyles that are being lived out there. Because, and you can do this for, with confidence, because those other lifestyles are not fulfilling they're not fulfilling. They're empty. They're hollow. They're, they're just sand. There's nothing of substance there. And so we live for Christ. We live in Jesus. And just by doing that, we're living lives that are exposing. You know, in this culture, fishermen, you know, they would put their nets out there, and sometimes their nets would pick up seaweed or they would pick up slime. And so what they would do is they would take their nets after a while and they would lay them on the rocks and they would expose them to the sunlight, and the sunlight would dry all of that stuff out to where they could just shake their nets, and all that stuff would just break off and fall away. And this is what he's talking about. We're exposing ourselves to the light of Christ so that he, it's easy for him to take the junk out of our lives, the slime out of our lives. Um, you're, you know, in, in this culture also, uh, their shops didn't have electric lights they didn't have leds and track lights to put on the wares that they were selling if they had baskets or pots or pans or musical instruments or clothing or whatever their shops the little cubicles the houses were dark they didn't have lights in so they would pull everything out into the streets and even to this day when you go into that culture of the middle east you see where everything is like a bazaar it's all out on the streets and people are out there bartering and buying and selling because they want to bring their craftsmanship out into the light where it's visible and this is what god is saying he says i want you're my craftsmanship you're my you're my masterpiece and i want you to walk in light so that people can see well, not that you're any kind of spiritual hot rod not that you're kind you know but, but it's what he has done in us the glory goes to jesus it's nothing i've done it's nothing i'm doing it's nothing i'll ever do it's all jesus and so that's, that's exposed, that's out there. Um, when I was a kid growing up, I used to watch all kinds of monster movies. Love monster movies. Scared the bejeebies out of me. Couldn't sleep, but for some reason that was fun. And um, you know, one of the things about monster movies is that, a good monster movie anyway, is that they kept the monster in darkness until about three-fourths of the way through the movie. You knew there was something there, but you never saw it. They kept it in the darkness, and then all of a sudden, you know, they'd put lights on it or something so they could see what they were up against. And this is what, this is what he's talking about. People are living in darkness, but we come out into the light, and we say, you know, Lord, here I am. In all my unglory and in all my sin, here I am. And the Lord exposes us, not for the sake of embarrassing us, but to build us up in him, that we walk in the light of, of, of who he is. I think it was Dietrich Bonhoeffer that said, secrecy is the dark room where the devil develops the negatives of sin. Secrecy is the dark room uh, where Satan develops the negatives of sin. Think about that. Verse 13, he goes on and he says, but all things become visible when they're exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. And so now there's this exposure. And, um, and, and, and we see, you know... Uh, secrecy is really a bad thing and you know i think is it the scriptures i think it's the scripture that says all it takes for the unrighteous to prosper is for the righteous to do nothing or to say nothing and, and we see this go you know I, don't, I just ask questions to myself all the time uh, um you know we live in a time when if we lie to congress it's a felony but if they lie to us it's just politics you ever thought about that we live in a time where we spend millions of dollars to rehabilitate a criminal and yet nothing for the victim. 
Why is that? We live in a time where schools can teach alternate lifestyles, but they can't mention God. Is there something wrong with the picture of our country? We live in a time when, it is, uh, when, it, when it's legal to kill the unborn, but it's a crime to put to death a cold-blooded murderer. We live in a time when we have ended communism and socialism by calling them progressives. We've done a name change and thinks that everything's okay. We live in a time when we're unable to close our border with Mexico, and yet we protect the 38th parallel in Korea. Have you ever thought about that one? We can protect and defend another nation's border, but we can't do that to ours. We live in a time when you can have pornography on your TV or your internet, but you can't put a nativity scene out. You know, what, what is the deal with that? We live in a time when we can use a human fetus for medical research, but not an animal or an animal's egg. We live in a time when we can take money from those who work really hard for it and give it to those who don't. We live in a time when we have free speech only if we're being politically correct. We live in a time when we've replaced parenting with Ritalin. We live in a time when we've taken the land of opportunity and made it a land of just handouts. We live in a time when all our problems are solved with higher taxes so our politicians can get back to their election campaigns. I'll tell you what, man, there is some serious bad mojo going on in our nation right now. Things are out of kilter. Things are out of sort. Oh, cursed spite. Remember Shakespeare said that? Time is out of joint. Oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. There's things that are out of joint in our nation, and the primary reason is is because we've forsaken the cistern of the presence of God and hewn out cisterns that cannot hold water. That's what Isaiah said. He said, we're digging these cisterns that have big fissures and cracks in them, and they can't hold water, and we've rejected the source and the fountain of living water, which is Christ. And so he's saying, man, walk in the light. Walk in the light. There, you know, I don't want to paint such a bleak, bleak picture because there are phenomenal things that God is doing right now in our culture. There's phenomenal things that God is doing. Um, uh, uh, right, uh, you know, Mark Batterson, I don't know if you, you know, Mark Batterson's the guy that wrote that book, In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. And he pastors a big church, actually seven different campuses right in D.C., started Ebenezer's Coffee House, which is now the most famous coffee house on Capitol Hill. He is really, really politically connected. And he said, before you give up too much hope, let me tell you that God has a whole rank and file of believers in D.C. that are standing strong for Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So there, I believe God wants to revive us. I believe God wants to spark that flame. And maybe he just needs to do it in each and every one of us, that we just draw a line in the sand and we say, you know what? I will allow the Lord to begin to revive me. I will allow the Lord to begin to restore passion in me. And this is kind of where Paul is going with this in the next verse. He says, for this reason, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, it's interesting because he said, awake, you who are asleep, and rise from the dead. He didn't say you were dead, but he's saying you're just like you were dead. In other words, if you all of a sudden walked into a, a mass grave, and there were a hundred dead people in that grave, but one of them was just laying there asleep, it'd be hard to tell that one from the rest of them. And this is what he's saying, as believers, you don't want to blend in so well with your surrounding that you're like a chameleon. You blend in so well with the world that there's no separation that shows you're not like that, you're different. And so he's saying, don't sleep with the dead, awake and come out and stand apart. And be willing to be reckoned as different, be willing to be reckoned as a follower of Jesus Christ. Because to just lay there sleeping with the world, that's carnal Christianity. That's living out of our carnal mindset. And he's saying, wake up. Wake up. Hear the alarm bells and wake up. Verse 15 and 16, therefore be careful how you walk. This whole thing, chapter 4, chapter 5, he's talking about walking. Your walk with the Lord, following Christ, imitators of Christ. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. 
Because the days are evil. He's saying walk in wisdom. Remember in chapter 1 he said, I pray that God give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And now he's saying walk in that wisdom. Walk wise because this world, 1 John says that this world lies in the power of the evil one. And because of that, he says, these days are evil. This whole, this whole system, this whole world, its economics, its political arenas, its entertainment arenas, everything, it's like the Titanic that's hit an iceberg, and it is going down. It is under a sentence of judgment. Jesus is coming again. And he's not coming as the Lamb of God to offer himself as a sacrifice. He's coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. I don't know about you, but if I was lost in the woods at night, and I'm walking through the woods at night, and I bump into something furry, I would rather it be a lamb. You know what I'm saying? I would rather it be a lamb. I wouldn't want to bump into a lion at night. Or squirrel. <laughs> well, there's none of them in the woods around my house, so it's okay. You know what I'm saying? And so this is what he's saying. He's saying Jesus is offering himself. He's presenting himself now as the Lamb of God. The doors of salvation have been opened. And he's saying now's the time because when he comes back again, he comes back with a rule of iron to break the nations into pieces and to rule with a rod of iron over this world. He's coming back as the judge of the living and the dead. He's coming back as the one who will send judgment on the enemy's kingdom and all all the kingdoms of the world. And so he's saying, these days are evil. I know that this is the life we live in and we think it's normal. How many of you saw The Matrix? The movie, The Matrix. Th that, that whole movie was about these people that were living in a computer program and they thought it was real. They thought, and that, well, that's what the whole thing was about. They were trying to break out of this matrix. They were trying to break. And, and, and the, 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 the symbolism of that movie towards Christianity is profound. Because everybody in this planet is living in a matrix of sin, and yet they think it's normal. They think it's what's real. And Jesus is saying, awake and come out of that. And I'll give you light and you will walk as a different person realizing that even though I'm in the world, I'm not of the world. And that he keeps me from the evil one. And I, even though I live on this planet, I'm just traveling through. My citizenship is really in heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven. You're, you got a passport. It's called the blood of Jesus. And it's stamped, accepted, and approved. And we are on our way to heaven. You know, the other day I was at Dunkin' Donuts, rode my bike over, my motorcycle over to Dunkin' Donuts, and I, and I was just sitting there and, and uh, watching the news and watching people come and go. And, um, and I looked on the floor. For some reason, I'm just sitting there, the TV's up there, people are coming in, and I look on the floor, and there was this crumpled dollar bill laying on the floor. And I said, I'm just going to watch this for a while. Do you know how many people? The dollar bill, I mean, it's something of value. It used to be. Uh, <laughs> and people come walking in, and they're looking around, and, and then they're looking at the menu, and person after person after person was walking by, Something of value, a dollar bill. I mean, I was sitting there saying, dude, if the next person doesn't scoff that up, I'm all over it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's a buck, and it's better in my pocket and in theirs. It's half of a cup of coffee. I'm good with that. But I'm, I'm just, I'm watching that, and everybody's just walking by, walking. And finally, it kind of lulled down. It wasn't anybody, so, you know, just kind of walk up there and grab it. And, and I'm kind of like, you know, anybody, anybody, anybody? And I thought, how many people live life and they're walking right by something of value. In this case, they couldn't see it because they weren't looking down. In this case, they can't see it because they're not looking up. They're not looking up. 
I want you to just close your eyes for a moment, just bow your heads this morning. I wonder if you might be here this morning. You probably don't even know why you're at church on a nice sunny day, but for whatever reason, God knew, and you're here. And you're hearing this message from the Scriptures, from God's love letter to your heart. And he's saying, I am right here. I am as close as your next breath. And my love for you is passionately beyond what you could ever imagine. Don't walk by. Don't miss the opportunity. Don't leave your passport behind and think you're going to be allowed into his kingdom. Jesus stretched out his arms open wide and had them nailed to a cross. And his arms now are still stretched open wide to embrace those who are not his yet. To welcome them into his family, into his love, into his kingdom. And to give to you the promise and the hope of eternal life. And that's just not quantity. That is a quality of life. That is unlike anything else this world can offer. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, man, Jesus is speaking to my heart. I I feel kind of weird inside right now. And, And I think God's speaking to my heart. I've never asked Jesus to come into my life. I've never confessed my sin to him, but I really feel like I want to do that this morning. I want to ask Jesus to come into my life, to come into my heart. If that's you this morning, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, you've never done this, but you'd say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus. If that's you right now, would you just raise your hand where I can see it in this building, in the sanctuary? Would you just put up, you say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to start being a follower of Jesus and to live for him, knowing that he, and only he, will give me access to to eternal life, forgiveness of sin, and heaven. Sir, one this morning, pastor, pray for me. Continue to keep your eyes closed for just a moment. How many of you, well, I know. I know that this is exclusive to everyone. You know loved ones that don't know Jesus. You have family members that are walking by that item of value and not even seeing it. And you say, I've tried to talk to them, I've tried to live right before them, I've tried to encourage them, and they're not seeing it. And you know the reason they're not seeing it is because the Bible says they're blind. You can't fault a blind person for not seeing a traffic light. You can't fault a blind person for failing to see a drop in the sidewalk curb because they're blind. And this is where intercession comes in because when you're interceding, you're saying, God, give them sight The blind man that Jesus healed, he said, I only know one thing. All I know is that once I was blind, and now I see, and it was Jesus that did it. And so right now, I would like to just take a couple of minutes, and I want you to take those loved ones, maybe their parents, maybe their children, maybe their brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles. Maybe it's a coworker or a best friend, and you know that they don't know Jesus. They're not living for God. They're not born again. And I want us to just take a a couple of minutes right now and just silently before the Lord call their names out out to him and say, Jesus, don't let them walk by. Give them light so that they can see. Lord Jesus, we lift these names to you this morning. We thank you that as the good shepherd, you're the one that leaves the 99 and goes after the one that's lost. Father, we lift names up to you of 
moms and dads and sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, friends. And we ask Jesus that as Savior, you would save them. In your mercy, O oh God, you would extend your hand to them and that you would open their eyes, that you would give them light to see the truth of the gospel in the face of Jesus Christ. Father, we know that this is a very sacred thing, a very holy thing. It's something only you can do. And so we intercede for these loved ones, and we pray, O oh God, that you would minister to them, that you would call out to them, that you would bring them into your fold, O oh God, that they would see the value, the unspeakable gift, the riches of your mercy in the person of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and that they would cry out to him as they awake from the sleep. And we thank you for your word again this morning. What a rich time we have at the banqueting table of your word. And as believers, God, help us to mimic, help us to imitate Jesus as followers of Jesus. Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, we do things we know we shouldn't do. But Lord, you pick us up, you brush us off, and you keep us going again and again. Help us, Lord, to go to that next level of where you want each and every one of us to be. Some of us have grown complacent. Some of us are comfortable where we are right now. But Lord, stir us in our hearts and give us that desire to take it up a notch, to ramp it up, to dial it up to the next level that we would follow you. And we thank you for all of these things in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said amen and amen. Hey, God bless you. Greet somebody again as you're leaving. Remember, there's fellowship and uh, refreshments out into the uh, foyer area in the cafe. God bless you.